are beginning a new study. As we have kind of moved into the, the fall season, and uh, for a lot of people, life kind of picks up its pace at this time of year. If you have kids, then, then your kids are going back into school, and so your, your calendar kind of fills up with all of the things that they are involved with. And if you don't have kids, and you just are at home by yourself, you still are working, and, and you're still kind of moving towards the holiday season, and all of the things that surround that. There is um, end-of-year budgets, and quotas, and all of those things that kind of crash in on us all at this time right as we celebrate what we call as Labor Day, which is a break from labor. But we're not very good about taking breaks from labor, are we? Life isn't supposed to be this way. 1964 article of Life magazine forecasted that soon there would be three-hour work days. That because of the advances in technology, that production is increasing and there are more workers entering into the, the workforce as population is increasing and all of those factors kind of combined that there's going to be a need for us to kind of cut back on our work and the biggest crisis going to face America in the coming generations is all the excess of leisure time. And so they followed that article up with this article. If I can find it. The emptiness of too much leisure, it asserted, that some of the middle-of-the-road profits of what automation is doing to our economy think that we are on the verge of a 30-hour work week. The task ahead, how to take life easy. So they say that those that are just kind of on the middle of the road, they're really not on board with all that technology is bringing to us. Even they acknowledge that it's not going to be long before the 30-hour work week comes in, but they are so optimistic that they think, we're going to start working three hours a day. And think about all that technology has brought to us. I have not spent a single day eating from my working of the land, which is a good thing because I don't like most foods that come from the land, <laughs> and I don't think I hold up very well in the sun either. So it's a good thing that that's happened, but I have never had to do that. I spent the last seven years living in a rural community in which most of the people were farmers. And the farmers, they were even marveling at, at how technology was changing the way that they work. That they had GPS in their combine tractors that they used to harvest the fields. They actually don't even have to drive anymore. They can program in their field and the GPS will then navigate that field. It will adjust the headers to the appropriate height based on all of the, the curves and the valleys and the, uh, it will adjust the speed of the tractor based on the moisture, all that kind of thing. They just sit there. And so it doesn't even take as many people to do that job anymore. <laughs> do you remember what it was like to make a phone call at one time? I mean, you actually had to um, have their phone number someplace. <laughs> it was either written down in a book that, that was called an address book, and you had to keep up with that book. And so, if you wanted to call somebody, either you had their number memorized or you had to go and find in that junk drawer through all that stuff and find the address book and then flip some pages and find their name and then find the phone number and then you actually had to spin something. <laughs> Do you remember how crazy that was? And then people decided, oh, that's too much work. What we need is, is let's just have it in here where we can push buttons. And so we created contact lists in our phones. 
But then somebody decided, hey, that's too much work. What I want to do is I just want to push one button and I want to say their name and then it will do all the dialing for me. So we've gone from having to physically get up and go and find a number, physically move things, to now I just push a button and I say I don't have to remember anything. And it all happens just like that. And yet, do you have any more leisure time? A popular MasterCard credit card commercial is now airing where they have children on buses and all around the city and they are chanting, one more day. Because MasterCard has discovered there are 400 million days of vacation that go unclaimed every single year in America. That 400 million days are provided, paid for by the employers, but we, as the employees, are not taking those days off. And when we do take it off, let's not fool ourselves into thinking that we really take it off. Because now we, we have email. Now we have our phone. We are always accessible. A recent New Yorker article asked this question. If we assume that there is, to a certain degree, a fixed amount of work necessary for society to function, how can we at once be more productive, have more workers, and yet still be working more hours? So we're not talking about just giving up all of work. We have to acknowledge that, that work is created by God and that we are created to work. There's a certain level of work that is necessary for society to function as God intended it to function. And we have technology that's coming along making it where we can be more productive with our time. There are more people on the planet and yet... We are working more hours now than people were generations ago. So how can we reconcile these two things? But I think the cause of our overworkedness is fear. It's fear that, that if I take off that time from work, then nobody else there can do what I can do. Everything's going to fall apart. If I'm not there, then they're going to find that I'm not all that valuable. Fear is what Psalm 46 is written to address. Scott mentioned that it has a very famous verse, but before we get to that famous verse, I want us to begin in verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, an ever present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. I find it interesting the natural phenomena that, that causes fear in us. It's always those events that we are unfamiliar with. So growing up in the Midwest, Tornadoes, thunderstorms were very frequent. 
And inevitably, whenever the tornado sirens would go off, alerting us that, that there were conditions conducive to tornadoes, and sometimes that there were even swirling of clouds that, that suggested that a funnel cloud could come down, the response of a lot of people who were born and raised in the Midwest was to go outside and look up into the sky <laughs> and watch. There was no fear. We wanted to see it happen. We didn't want to see anybody get hurt, but we wanted to see it happen. What scared us the most is earthquakes. <laughs> because with tornadoes, there's, there's the knowledge of how weather patterns work and, and we can predict, sometimes even weeks in advance, that, that there's going to be some conducive patterns that's going to, to lead to this. But earthquakes, they, there's no warning. With tornadoes, you can take shelter in some place that is safe. But it, in an earthquake, what you find to be your safe place, what is most sturdy, is the very thing that's shaking. <laughs> and water. Water is one of the greatest fears that, that Americans have. Because just like the earth, the foundations of the earth shaking, whenever water moves, it it can sweep you off your feet. It can knock you off balance. You have no control over water. A couple of years ago, I was watching a documentary on uh, the, the Hoover Dam. And they, they showed how there was this one leak that had started. And it was very small. But because of the massive force of water that was coming through there, even though we think we can control that water, it was just completely demolishing the cement. Or cement. It was just destroying the, the foundation of what we thought to be impenetrable. And whenever those things shake, whenever what you place your foundation on and your equilibrium gets off balance, that is the most terrifying thing that anyone can experience. And the psalmist says that whenever those seasons of life come, whether they actually be literal and those uh, earthquakes come and the storms, the floods rise, or whether they be the metaphorical kind and whenever you have those earth-shattering moments or whenever you feel flooded, fear comes into the picture. And what a lot of us do whenever we get afraid is we get to work. As we, we start putting the pieces together to, to make sure that everything is under control. I find it interesting that one of the greatest displays of power that God has shown in the history of the world was in the Exodus story as he showed his dominion over all the Egyptian gods. He brought the people across the Red Sea, parted the waters. This chaos was stilled. The voice of God. And you want to know what the first lesson that God teaches the people? He teaches them stillness. In Exodus 16, verse 25, Eat the manna today, Moses said, because today is a Sabbath to the Lord. You will not find any of it on the ground today. Six days you are to gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will not be any. Nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it, but they found none. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That is why on the sixth day he gives you bread for two days. The first lesson that God teaches to this fledgling nation is not to work, but to be still. 
He's providing bread for them and they have to go out and work. They have to go out and gather it on six days. But the lesson that they need to learn is they need to learn to be still. Then Jesus comes along as God in flesh. And in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is starting to, to gain a lot of attention. People are just flocking to him. And then he does this fascinating thing. Luke 6, verse 15. The news about Jesus spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sickness. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. That doesn't make any sense. The momentum is building, Jesus. You know, this is when you want to you go all in. You want to push all the chips in. You want to go full force. You want to put all of your energy into it. You want to put in the extra hours and keep this momentum rolling. But Jesus takes a break. He gets still. Because... What the psalmist is telling us and what Jesus wants us to see is that being still defines who is God. Whenever we work and get frantic out of our anxiety, we think that Life is going to be better if we're in control of it. But being still is a reminder that life actually functions a whole lot smoother when I'm not active at all. Now what happens more smoothly? My sermon or the sun rising and setting? What happens more consistently, more regularly, more dependably. The initiatives that I try and, and get started or the stars showing up in their seasons. See, it's fool's gold to think that, that if only you keep working, that you're going to be able to get everything under control and once things settle down, then you'll take a break. The reality is that God wants you to be still to remind you that you are not God and He is. And whenever we are still, it is a quiet act of defiance against a culture that believes that busyness is the definition of success. When is the last time that, that you've been talking to somebody and they asked you how things have been going and you've been able to say that things are really slow and not felt guilty? When is the last time that, that you have not felt the urge to respond by saying that, man, it's been really busy? And whenever you hear that, when's the last time that you didn't respond by saying, well, that's a good problem to have. Because we define success as busyness. This is why you have companies like Amazon that recently made headlines because they are creating this culture where the expectation is that people are working 70 plus hours a week. And yet, whenever you make a decision to be still. You are quietly defying this culture that says success is about busyness. Being still defines who is God and who is not God. And being still still applies today. The psalm begins with chaos, but the refrain throughout, refrain throughout this psalm is repeated twice. And many scholars actually believe that it was repeated after each of the three stanzas. 
but it should actually show up um, after verse 3, and then it shows up after... Um, Verse, it shows up in verse 7, and then the last verse. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Abraham, or the God of Jacob, rather, is our fortress. It still speaks. We still need to be still. Stillness is the reminder that success will not be defined by our busyness, but by our obedience. That's a different category of success. And I'm not saying that things will go smoothly for you. I'm not saying that it's easy to be still. I stand before you confessing that this morning I have been less still than any other Sunday morning uh, probably since I have moved here. This has just been one of those weeks where it was hectic and I needed to stay up late to, to get things finished and get up early and nothing really seemed to be going the way that I wanted and every step I took I remembered something else that needed to be done. Last week, after church, my family, we went to eat with uh, Robert Meyer and his family, his kids. And then on the way home, it was kind of late and we'd had a busy week. And two, our two youngest kids fell asleep in the car. And our, our three-year-old is reaching that age where she thinks she doesn't need to take naps and she refuses most days. And every day is defiant about the fact that she's not tired. Even though, as a parent, you can clearly see she's tired. And it was one of those days driving and she says, I'm not tired, I don't want to take a nap. And it wasn't long before she fell asleep. We pull into the driveway and I get out and I go over and pick, uh, unbuckle her and pick her up. She never wakes up. And I climb up the flight of stairs carrying her and I get in the bathroom to have her go to the bathroom before I lay her down and as soon as I set her down she I'm not tired daddy <laughs> like yeah I, I believe you regardless of whether she knows it or not or is willing to admit it or not stillness is for her benefit See, I, I'm not doing this series because I think that more people need to start showing up on Sunday mornings. This isn't a, a series about going to church. That, that's important, and we, we talk about that at other times. But this is about you stilling yourself to know who is God. Be still and know that I am God. It's all of the noise, all of the busyness that we surround ourselves with that prevents us from having a relationship with God that we really want. It's all of the, the entertainment that we constantly bombard ourselves with, all of the images and all of the music that we have in front of us at all times that prevents us from hearing the voice of God. See, I don't, I'm not doing this series because I want something from you. I'm doing this series because I want something for you. I want something for myself. That we need to be still because God said that it's good for us. And so what I'm wanting you to do it's not just to come to this place to worship. But I want us to start doing something with what we read from God's Word. So over the next four weeks during this series, you have an insert in your connection. And I hope that all of you got it. And what I'm asking of you is that you take some time during the week to be still. 
This week, what I want you to do, what I'm challenging you to do, is to, to every single day, just to read Psalm 46. It's only 11 verses here. It's very brief. You can do it in just a few short minutes. But to read this psalm and reflect on your day. To be still before God. And then five days during the week, there's some guided questions here. The first day, focusing on verse one, as God says that, as the psalmist says that, that God is our refuge and strength and ever present help and trouble. Focus on that verse. What characteristics of God make Him a good refuge and strength? And I want you to take this piece of paper and place it on your your dinner table. Or if your, your dinner table is too messy, maybe you, you place it on your nightstand. Place it someplace where you are every single day where you can pick it up and just for a few minutes, even if it's just for five minutes that day, that you get still before the Lord. And I also want to encourage you to discuss this as a family. Whatever family it is that you live with, some of you, you don't have kids at home and it's just you and your spouse. Discuss it with your spouse. Find out what they think about these questions. Some of you, maybe you journal, maybe you write things down. This can be something that you can add to that to enhance where you're going and help us to be still before the Lord. If you're by yourself, you're, you're a widow, it, there are people around you Maybe it's your neighbor. Maybe it's your, your son or daughter. Maybe they don't even live in the city. You can call them and you can do this with them. And if, if there's no one else, then pick somebody else here at this church and do it with them. Just five days. You don't have to do it every day. I know some of you... Uh, Certain days are just, it's jammed packed. Just take a moment for five days to be still and know that He is God, and that you are not. And let's just see. Let's just test God in this, over this four-week period of time. Let's just test God and see if He will not prove that He is God. Let's see if all of the things that we worry about, all of the, the parts of our world that we think are crumbling all around us, let's see what God does in those areas. And yes, it may mean that you decide that you, you stop. That you just call it an end to the day. That you turn the phone off. That you don't check your email. That you don't respond to the text. To be still and know that He is God. We're going to sing a song of invitation. And if you would like to respond to the message that God is God that He is a strength and refuge, then we are here for you. If we can help you and in some way, why don't you come as we stand and sing together.